You're listening to the Grace Watcher Broadcasting Network. This is Apostle Paul E. Jones, and I am a Native American preacher. And I preach to the called, to the chosen, and to the faithful. And the Spirit of the Lord shall pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God has called upon the earth the fivefold ministry, the apostles and prophets, and evangelists and pastors and teachers, to equip the saints, to bring the world into hope, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. This is the Great Watcher Report. Greetings on this Thursday evening for this edition of the Grace Watcher Report. And we have a most interesting program today. So I just want you to sit back and I want you to relax and listen to what's going to happen today because it's going to be a very special day, a special time. We can lift up our Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. As you could tell, the title of today's program it's probably eye opening and you'll probably wonder where in the world is this preacher going with this being a Mormon in a modern world yep So we want you to sit back. We want you to relax. Because we got a bumpy ride coming up ahead. Got his son, my God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I said, My God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You gotta believe Jesus Christ, you gotta believe. Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. I said, My God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. I said, My God so loved the world that he gave his only. We got to sign, you gotta believe in Jesus Christ. You gotta believe in Jesus Christ. But God so loved the world that he gave. This only begotten Son. I said, My God, so love the world 
that he gave his only begotten son. I said, my God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You got to believe in Jesus Christ. You got to believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you gotta believe in Jesus Christ. Don't you know you gotta believe in Jesus Christ? You gotta believe in Jesus Christ. Don't you know? In Jesus Christ, you gotta believe, hallelujah, in Jesus Christ, let me tell you, gotta believe, in Jesus Christ, don't you know you gotta believe, in Jesus Christ, let me tell you, you gotta believe in Jesus Christ. For oh my God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I said, My God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I said, My God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. You gotta believe in Jesus Christ. You gotta believe in Jesus Christ. You've gotta believe in Jesus Christ. You gotta believe, hallelujah, you gotta believe, hallelujah. Oh yes, we gotta believe. I've always been one that loves studying the scriptures. There's just something about Digging into the Word of God. That as you keep digging, as you keep studying, and you keep applying. It has a way of changing you and transforming you and making you into the image. That God desires us to be. I remember as a young child, I was raised in my grandfather's church. He was pastor of a local church back in mountains of Virginia. And I remember one of the phrases he used to say to me, he says, When you preach, always preach from the book. And some of you may be wondering, what book was he talking about? He was talking about the Bible. So I remember in the early days of the 1970s through the 1980s. Studying the word of God and having a chance to get up a few times and preaching this word. But I would always spend time with my heavenly father to seek his face. That I would always be preaching what he would want me to say. In 1984, I graduated from high school and I immediately went into a Christian college. Out in a little town outside of Richmond, Virginia. 
And I remember being a student of the Bible, sitting in the classes week after week after week after week, and I would hear some of the things that the various professors and teachers and scholars would share. And it would always be ideologies and thoughts that came from various so-called biblical scholars over the year. And they had a lot of doctrines and a lot of teachings that was kind of confused to me, such as the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the rapture and whether the gifts of the Spirit were still in operation in the world today. And and did we have apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers? And, and many times I would raise my hand in a lot of the classes and I would ask questions. Were there apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and and they would tell me, you know, those were done away with. But I kept raising my hand. And I would ask questions. I said, Professor, explain to me the doctrine of the Trinity. You say that there's one God, but he's in three persons, but still he is one God. And they are co-eternal, co-equal, and co-together. But at the same time, you call them a day, but you say at the same time, uh, they are one God. And, and, and the professors would keep telling me, well, you have to accept those things by faith. Martin Luther said this about the Trinity. Jonathan Edwards said this about the Trinity. John Cal Calvin said this about the Trinity. And, and, and all these various teachers throughout history said this about the Trinity. And I said, well, what does the Word of God say about the Trinity? And they would pat me on the head and say, Paul, just sit down and accept what's being taught to you here in this Bible school. If you want to be a preacher one day, you have to accept these doctrines because these doctrines have been along with us for a long time. And then I would ask questions like, where are the apostles today? Where are the prophets today? We don't need apostles and prophets. All we need is just, just a pastor and maybe a few evangelists that goes out and preaches the gospel to the lost. And then I said, the lost? I thought the lost is the lost house of Israel. And they would look at me and say, Paul, just, just, just don't talk about that kind of stuff. Just, just sit down. Just sit down. Sit down. And I remember in 1989, graduating from college, Receiving a master's of biblical studies and divinity, but I, I I was walking away confusing. I was walking away confused because I would pick up the Bible, and it would constantly talk about prophets and modern day apostles and how they led the early church, and and then you've got all these so called. Bible scholars saying God did away with all of that because all we need is the Bible. But with this Bible, I found out that there's 30 some thousand denominations all over the world claiming to be interpreters and explainers of this book. But nobody would tell me about the gifts of the Spirit and all this kind of thing. Now, I've been in a few Pentecostal churches over the years and, and a few charismatic churches. And they got something going on. But I saw too much fake. I saw too much phony. It was all about the money. Every time there was a service in a Pentecostal church or a, or, or a charismatic church, they, they, would talk, they would constantly be talking about offerings. They would be talking about giving gifts of seed and so forth. And, and, and none of that made any sense because when I had to read the Bible and when God was planting seeds, he was really planting his word. But all these preachers would run around and say, no, 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 no. We are prophets. We are apostles. And it, it just didn't make any sense. We're apostles and we're prophets. Yeah, prophets are right. Not P-R-O-P-H-E-T, but P-R-O-F-I-T, prophets, make, make, making money, and you know, so forth. And I would see people, you know, slain out in the spirit, and some people would shake and shiver during the church services, calling it the Pentecostal experience. But I didn't see what 
a true apostle really was. I didn't see what a what a, what a true prophet really was. I just saw a lot of manifestations of physical fleshly ideas. But are they really modern day apostles and prophets? We will talk about that later on. We worship the name of the Lord. And we worship the name of the Lord. We worship the day of the Lord Everywhere that we go Hallelujah And each and every day Now we worship the day of the Lord Worship the name of the Lord. And we worship the name of the Lord. And everywhere that we go, hallelujah. And each and every day. That we go, hallelujah, and each and every day. And we worship the name of the Lord. Yeah, and we worship the name of the Lord. That we worship the name of the Lord and Everywhere that we go Hallelujah And each and every day Hallelujah And everywhere that we go Worship the name of 
name of the Lord. Now we worship the name of the Lord. Oh, 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 The day of the Lord. In 1989 was the beginning stage that something was about to change. Something was about to be let loose. Because with all these doubts and confusions, I moved to a little city called Knoxville, Tennessee. And as I came to the city, a radical thing began to happen to me. And this radical thing was going to the public library. You say, go to a public library? Why in the world would you go to a public library? Because in a, in a public library, there are books. Lots and lots and lots of books. Long before there was internet, long before there was the web, long before there was Facebook and, and Twitter and AOL and all those kind of things, <laughs> there was a library. And I was determined to find out everything. I I really wanted to know the truth. Because I was in the seminary for four years and I heard the various professors. We read from Martin Luther. We read from John Calvin. We read from Jonathan Edwards. We read from all of the Reformed scholars. We read from... Catholic scholars, we read from charismatic scholars, we read from Pentecostal scholars, but now I needed to know the truth myself. Because here I am a preacher. And being a preacher, you have a calling that's upon your life. Because from the early days of the early days of 1970s through the 1980s, and now we're getting through the 1990s, now we got 1989, and, and I'm moving to Knoxville, Tennessee, hanging out the library and, and visiting various churches throughout the community. I wound up at a local, you know, Baptist church. And Baptists, they have a great zeal. They, they, they really love this Bible. They would encourage people to, to memorize scriptures one after the other because they believed in, in quoting the Bible. And I have no problem with that. No problem at all in quoting the Bible. But during all these times, I was still sneaking that library. And I still would sneak and study. You know, I I studied all religions. I, I studied various interpretations of Christianity. I was studying Hinduism. I was studying Buddhism. Dabbled in a little bit of uh, witchcraft, the occult, and and so forth. And, and I saw a lot of common ideology. And while I was studying all of that. Something began to happen in 1995. And we will share about that coming up next. Jehovah, that daddy 
is his name, I said Jehovah. The dead is his name, I said Jehovah. The dead is his name, his name is Jehovah. Yeah, Jehovah, the dead is his name, I said Jehovah. The dead is his name, I said Jehovah. The dead is his name, I said his name is Jehovah. Then make a joke of noise to Jehovah. Serve Jehovah with gladness. I said it'd come before his presence would sing. And I said I know that it is the Elohim. Jehovah, the that is his name. I said Jehovah, the that is his name. I said Jehovah, that is his name. I said his name is Jehovah. I said Jehovah, the that is his name. I said Jehovah, the that is his name. I said Jehovah, the that is his name. I said his name is Jehovah. I make a jump of noise, I chew Jehovah, now to serve Jehovah with gladness. I said to come before his presence would sing again. I said I know that it is him, Elohim, Jehovah. The that is his name, I said Jehovah. The that is his name, I said Jehovah. The that is his name, I said his name is Jehovah. Jehovah, the dead is his name, I said Jehovah. The dead is his name, I said Jehovah. The dead is his name, I said his name is Jehovah. His name is Jehovah. His name is Jehovah. Jehovah, that is his name. Jehovah, the dead is his name. Jehovah, the dead is his name. I said Jehovah, the dead is his name. Jehovah, the dead is his name. Jehovah, the dead is his name. Jehovah, that is his name. As you can tell, I'm Native American. Because that's what my heritage was based upon. The Native American tradition. But getting back to my story. 1995 came on the scene. And I remember I enrolled in a local college because I knew in 1995, that computers and the internet and all those kind of things was going to be the future of education. So I enrolled at a local college and took a, a few computer classes, typing classes and programming classes and all those kind of things. But still in the back of my mind and still in the back of my heart, I still knew that there must be something out there that kind of had an idea that I had. And that was, are they modern-day apostles? Are they modern-day prophets? Or are, are, are they modern-day, you know, Bible scholars that love the Word? You know, I have preached many times that in the beginning there was the spoken word. Our Heavenly Father was the spoken word person. And through that spoken word, he gave us what is called the written word. And we have the written word found in the Bible. We have the written word found in the book of Enoch. We have the written word found in the book of Jubilees. We have the written word found in the book of Jasher. And we have the written word that's found, you know, in the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the early 40s. And later on in the 1940s, we, ha we have the Nag Habitus scripture. So we got scriptures all over the place. But I still kept asking those questions. And there was a young man that was in one of the classes that I was taking. And this young man, we used to talk about religion all the time. And I asked him one day and I said, you know, I, I, I'm a Bible student and I, 
and 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 I, and I read that book backwards and forwards and all those kind of things. And I said, um, wouldn't it be nice to know that there was a church today that believed in modern day apostles and prophets and the gifts of the spirit and all those kind of things. And he said something there, and I, and I mean, this thing, it really opened my mind. It really opened my mind. He said, actually, there is. I said, where? And that's when he began to open my faith and open my mind to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Back then, we used to call it the Mormon Church. He said, in our church, we have apostles and we have prophets. He said, in fact, in our administrations, we have 12 apostles and we also have 70 apostles. Well, the Bible started popping really good in my mind. I mean, it really, I mean, it popped. I said, in the early days of the early church, they had 12 apostles. Jesus called 12 people to be apostles. And then later on, he called 70 more people to be apostles. And these apostles go around baptizing people and calling people to the ministry and setting them apart as elders in churches all over the church. And and, and this young man was telling me how, how his church did all of that, that they had apostles and they would call people into various parts of the ministry. And in, in these ministries, they would, they would send people all over the world to preach the gospel to various countries and various lands. And, I, and, and it's my mind. I said, I need to know more about this. So this young man started telling me the story about Joseph Smith, um, the prophet of the early church, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, how that God had called him to restore the church. And and that right there was another mind-opening. Because I remember studying, you know, Martin Luther and John Calvin and all these people, and they never talked about restoring the church. They always talked about reforming the church. And way deep in the back of my mind, that's what I always thought. I said, wait a minute. The church don't need to be reformed. It needs to be restored. The back, the way it was in the days of the early church. You know, the one that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I begin to think something's going on because the churches around us, they, they, uh, they are not demonstrating this today. And so, you know, um, this young man was talking about his church. And so I begin to study with the elders of this church and I begin to seek the face of the Lord with this church, and I wound up, you know, becoming a member because they believed in that you had to repent, you had to be baptized, and and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit with the laying of of hands. And I will always respect what was taught to me in my beginning days of becoming a Mormon. But, Again, I was still lacking something because when I would watch general conference of the prophets and apostles, they kept repeating the same stuff every general conference. But where are the prophecies? Where are the revelations? Doesn't the church believe in modern day revelations? Where are they? All these prophets and apostles, all they're talking about is going to the temple and getting married in the temple, um, keeping your covenants that you made at baptism, keeping your covenants that you made in the temple. But where are... The prophetic voices. I'm telling you, over the years, folks, there's been some tragic things that have gone on in this world. 
And we need prophetic voices. Even during this 2020 stuff. With this pandemic that's going on. We haven't got any prophetic voices. The only thing we get is trust your government. Trust your government. Trust your leaders. Trust your prophets. Trust your apostles. But no prophetic mandates. So, our modern day churches are failing us. The Catholic church is failing us. Protestant churches, you are failing us. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you are failing us. You're not giving us prophetic words. I remember studying the early works of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and, and all these amazing prophets. I mean, they had words to say about modern-day government. They had words about deceptions and lies and deceits. And it, it just seems that all the preachers today are gathering together and saying, do what you see on TV. If they're saying to do this, do this. It's like everything that the scriptures tells us and everything that the early prophets have told us is put on a burner somewhere. And people don't look like they're waking up. It's like it's a cultural thing. The scriptures, they talk about the synagogue of Satan. Mystery Babylon. The church of the devil. And I could go on and on and on and on. And then it talks about the church of Christ. But nobody is seeing that there's two churches in the world. Nobody is seeing that there's two gods in the world. A true God and another God that's pretending to be God. No, it seems like nobody is seeing the difference. It seems like all the churches are watching the media. They're watching what they're being told and what they're being dictated. But no prophetic words. No prophetic mandates. Even in the early days of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they had a council of 50 men. They were the governmental body of the church. But we don't have that anymore. What's going on? Let me tell you a lot of shocking things. When doctors and lawyers and business people rule your churches, you're going to have a problem. Especially when the doctors and the lawyers and business people are working together to make money. I could take more but I don't want to get this um, message cleared away by allegorisms because certain words, when you say those certain words, it causes various social media allegorisms putting you on a list of what to say and what not to say. Because words have meaning. And words today are used to pick apart which side you're on. Even with all the things that are going on in this world today, we need some prophetic words and prophetic mandates in this world. All my life. 
I knew that I was called to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And being an apostle, nobody calls us except God. Now, apostles can call, you know, pastors and elders and so forth. But when it comes to an apostle, nobody calls them. God calls an apostle. An apostle has a message, a mandate to the church. Because Christ told Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. The rock is that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. This is the mandate that must be expounded to the church. That he is the head of the church. Christ is the authority of the church. Not the Pope. Not that man. Or those men sitting there in Salt Lake City. Not the president of the Presbyterian Church. Or the Southern Baptist Church. Or the Church of God Church. Or the United Pentecostal Church. Christ is the head of the church. If he is the son of the living God. The Christ. He is the one that we follow. As an apostle, I am nothing but a mouthpiece of Christ. And this mouthpiece has something to say to the church. You need a prophetic mandate. You need a prophetic word. Your prophetic mandate and your prophetic word is... Repent, return back to God, or perish. And I know a lot of people ain't going to like that. You want deeper revelations? You want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? You want the anointing? You want the glory? You want the power? You've got to return back to God. Because the only way the anointing is going to return on the church, the only way the power is going to return to the church, the church has got to return back to their first love. There ain't no other way around it, folks. I believe that God brought me through the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because I learned so much there. But now, over the years, I'm seeing a difference in being a cultural Christian and actually being a Holy Ghost-filled Christian. There is a major difference. There was a time in history when you said you was a Christian, people could trust your business. They could trust your word. But nowadays, that's all out of whack. Because everybody's saying they're Christians. Because it's a cultural thing to call yourself a Christian. But when you call yourself a Holy Ghost filled Christian, that, that, that is a different ballpark. Because even in the Latter-day Saints church, they preach in modern-day apostles. They preach in modern-day prophets. They preach in the gifts of the Spirit. So does the Catholic church. Many of the Protestant churches. But do we see it demonstrate? When's the last time you've seen someone cast out a devil? When was the last time you've seen someone stand up and give a prophetic word to the people of God. When was the last time you seen people healed?
people delivered from the power of the devil. If there's never been a demonic infestation, it is going on right now as I am preaching to you. Through this political mandate that's happening all over the planet, people are being injected with something demonic. But do you hear your leaders in the Catholic Church say anything about it? Nope. Do you hear your people in the Mormon Church say anything about it? Nope. Do you hear the people in the Protestant Church say anything about it? Nope. Do you hear anything saying in all the other denominations all over the world say anything about it? Nope. They're all saying, just follow your government. Because Romans 13 says to believe and follow your government when they don't even know what Romans 13 is really talking about. It's talking about the authority of the church. Not the authority of the Republican Party. Not the authority of the Democratic Party. Not the authority of presidents. Not the authority of governors. Not the authority of mayors. It's the authority of your leaders in your churches. Your leaders in your churches are telling you to kiss the asses of the synagogue of Satan. The church of the devil. The church of Babylon. Oh, we got to wake up, people. We got to see the truth for what it really is. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, El Shaddai. Jesus is that chief cornerstone. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and he's the last. He's the Lord of my future. He's the God of my past. And I'm going to praise his name. I got to praise his name. I got to praise his name. Everywhere that I go. Hallelujah. Everywhere that I go. Jehovah Child. Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Shalom. El Shaddai, but Jesus is the dead, the chief cornerstone. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and he's the last. He's the Lord of my future. He's the God of my past. I'm gonna praise his name. I got to praise his name. I got to praise his name. Everywhere that I go, hallelujah. Everywhere that I go, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah DC, Jehovah, I shall go. El Shaddai, Jesus is that, a chief cornerstone. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and he's the last. He's the Lord of future. He's the God of my past. And I'm gonna praise His name. I got to praise His name. I got to praise His name. Everywhere that I go, 
Hallelujah, everywhere that I go. 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 So have you been listening for the last few minutes to what I've been saying? Have you been heeding the word? Now let it do something to change you. Let it do something to bring you to the place that our Heavenly Father desires you to be. Because once you do that, you will never understand anything else in this life. Blind, but now I see. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Revival, renewal, and restoration to all God's people. Be sure to check us out next time for another exciting episode of the Grace Watcher Report. This is Apostle Pauline Jones, and I am a Native American preacher, and I preach to the called, and to the chosen, and to the faithful. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs>